God just, I, I don't know, the, <sighs> excited is a good word uh, for the message that, I, that God's burdened my heart with tonight for a number of reasons, but just the peace uh, that this message brought my heart as I was studying, uh, I hope it'll do the same for you. But we do appreciate you being with us. Thank you so much, and, and uh, just want to praise the Lord for his blessings, uh, the liberty this morning, uh, and, and I just thank him uh, for the burdens that he gives us and the times that he gives them to us. As far as our announcements go, Pastor Deacon Fellowship, Monday, January 31st at 630. Uh, parents Night Out, uh, Friday, February the 11th from 6 to 9 p.m. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer. Please make sure you sign up for that or send word uh, and we'll add it to the list. It'll also, donations of $5 per child is appreciated but not required. And if you'd like to help or you've got any other questions, you can see Miss Wendy or Miss Cassie. Uh, Youth Wild uh, Trip is June the 6th through the 11th this year. Please see Sister Christy about registration because the early bird discount ends February the 1st. And folks, that's just next Tuesday. <laughs> if that'll give you kind of an idea of how close we are to that. Uh, so please uh, keep that in mind as well. That's our announcements. Also, don't forget that tonight after the service, uh, we'll be uh, having our prayer time. Uh, so those of you that are on the private side of the live stream, just hang around. We'll be right back after the service uh, to share prayer requests and needs and praises. So let's just pray that God would have his way uh, in each of those. If you're joining us, like I said, uh, via the live stream, thank you for being here. If you're seeing us later uh, on YouTube, thank you for taking some time to be with us. Hope the message tonight is a blessing and a help. Uh, like I said, uh, it encouraged my heart, and it was, it was just, uh, sometimes, and I, I know the other preachers here in the church, Brother Jerry and, and Brother Mike and, and Brother Brandon, Brother David, uh, sometimes there's some messages when you study for them, it's a misery. <laughs> I mean, just a misery personally. I mean, I'm not kidding. Uh, but then there are times that there's some, it just the whole time you're working on it, the Lord's just blessing your heart, and this was one of them for me. And so I'm really excited about that. But let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get right into the message tonight. Father, we love you, and we thank you so much for how much you love us. Thank you for the provision. Thank you uh, that we've seen here in just the last week or so, Father, how you've uh, helped to meet needs that people have had. Father, we can't thank you and give you praise enough uh, for all that you've done and the way that you've moved and worked in the hearts and lives of people. Father, we just ask that you'd continue to touch the, and, and meet the needs beyond the physical. Father, I pray that you'd touch uh, hearts and, and minds, and, and Father, that you'd give peace where it's needed. And Father, we, we just, we're just going to look to you to be and do all that only you can do. And Father, we ask that you'd be with us in the service tonight, be with Rama as they're meeting downstairs. I pray that the Word of God would be taught and our children would pick up on things Father, even at the youngest ages, that will set a foundation for teaching later on. Father, we pray that if there's a child down there tonight that doesn't know Christ as Savior, that something that's said, something that's taught, will show them the need that they have of Jesus. Father, I pray you'd work, uh, work in the hearts of our youth as they're meeting tonight. Father, I pray that you'd just continue to touch them. And then, Father, we pray that you'd be with us in our service here in the sanctuary tonight, excited about the truth of the Word of God that you've burdened my heart with. May uh, Father, I pray that just a, a, a small, even just a small part of how much of a blessing this was to me spills out of me into the lives of others as I try to share what you had for this evening. Father, we love you, and we do thank you and praise you for the privilege and opportunity to be here. And Father, help us to gather around your word, and Father, uh, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. We ask it all in the sweet and precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter number 2. Mark chapter number 2, very, very familiar passage of Scripture. As we'll be uh, reading verses 1 through 12. Mark chapter number 2, verses 1 through 12. Mark chapter number 2, verses 1 through 12. Bible says, and again, he, being Christ, entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. 
And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed, and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Father, we ask once again, not because we haven't already prayed, but just asking now for a special touch of the Holy Spirit of God. Father, I pray that he would touch me and give me the liberty to say what you've burdened my heart with and touch each of our hearts to see the truths in this passage that you'd have us to see, apply them to our life, and may it truly make a difference in how we live and how we think. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I was listening to a radio program the other day while I was in the truck driving actually back and forth to the church, and, and the discussion was actually about the woman caught in adultery in John chapter number 11. And as I listened to that teaching, I began to just kind of rejoice at the wonder and the blessing of forgiveness. David, meditating on these same thoughts about the wonder that it is that God would forgive us, was moved by the Holy Spirit to write in the 32nd Psalm, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Selah. And you've heard me say before that that little phrase there basically means just stop and think about that. I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said I will confess my, confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Now, you've heard me say before when I preached a message on this passage in Psalm 32 that in verses 1 and 2, we see the blessing of forgiveness. In verses 3 and 4, we see the pain of unconfessed sin. In verse number 5, we see a description of what repentance looks like. And then in verse number 6, we see the time of repentance. Now, as I meditated on those things, as I listened to them talk, and then I went back to this passage of Scripture, as I thought about those things, uh, immediately Satan began his attacks and, and his insinuations. Well, you still sin. And, and you're just trying to soothe your conscience because of the things that you do and the things that you've done. And, and, and you know how sinful you really are. Ever heard those what things in your head? I've said many times that Satan does not fight fair. He either tempts you directly or indirectly to sin, and then he beats you up once you've done it. And then, even after going to God for forgiveness, he never lets you forget it. But then God brought me to this passage as I was thinking about all of these things. God brought me to this passage here in Mark chapter number 2, uh, and usually, when you study the gospel of Mark, 
uh, the narratives, the accounts that he gives are usually very brief. And if you go to Matthew or you go to Luke, you see richer or fuller details about the same event. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are considered to be what they call the synoptic gospels. And all it means, sin, like synonym means the same. Optic means to see. So a lot of the stuff that you see in Matthew and in Mark and in Luke are the same accounts. They saw the same things. And so they talk about things in very similar terms. But what you'll always, almost always find is that one of them gives you a little bit more depth. One of them talks about things in a little bit more detail. And usually, that's Matthew and Luke. That's why there's over 20-some chapters in Matthew and Luke and only 16 <laughs> in the Gospel of Mark. Usually, Mark is very concise. He tells you what happens and he moves to the next account. And, and, but here... In Mark chapter number 2, the exact opposite is true. Instead of Matthew and Luke giving us extra detail, we find it instead here in the book of Mark, in chapter number 2, about this man who was sick of the palsy. Now, as I read this passage and was thinking about it online of all of these things, three things spoke to my heart about the blessing of, of forgiveness. First off, we need to remember that Christ knows your heart. Look at verse number five. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, have you ever noticed in this passage that even though these men came, the four who bore him plus the man who was sick with the palsy, have you ever noticed that they came for Christ to heal this man, to heal this man physically, but that Christ does not address that need first? Instead, he tells them that this man's sins are forgiven. Now, we all know, and you've heard me talk about this in uh, various times over the last several years, that not every sickness can be attributed to sin. Sickness, including paralysis, and that's what palsy was, is a result of living in a world affected by the curse. So every time you get sick, that's not a sign that you've got to confess sin in your life and you need to figure out why and confess it so you can be healed. That's the same name it and claim it stuff that we've been talking about on Wednesday nights, right? So not every time you get sick is it the result of sin. It's the fact that we live in a sin-cursed world that all of us are susceptible to sin, and until the Lord comes back, we're also all susceptible to death. But, and that's why everybody, saint and sinner alike, does get sick. But given Christ's response... Here in this situation where he looks at this man and says, and, and he's talking specifically to the one who's on the bed because he says, son, not sons, not all of them that brought him in him, just son. He says, son, thy sins be forgiven you. That tells us that this particular sickness, this palsy, this paralysis that he had was not the result of disease so much as it was the result of of sin. We know that some sinful behavior is what contributes to a disease taking over a body, like drunkenness causes cirrhosis of the liver, right? Now, that being the case, knowing that this man is paralyzed from some sinful practice, some sinful habit, maybe it was just a sinful event, maybe he got drunk and fell off, you know, fell and broke his neck. Who knows? All we know is that he had the palsy, all right? So something had happened, and you can, that some sin had contributed to this man's paralysis. And, and, and so you can imagine right now what's going through this man's mind. His friends may have been the one who recommended the trip to see Jesus and ask for healing. But in the back of this man's mind was the thought, I know that I am the way that I am because of sin. I'm sorry for my sin. But even if he can heal me, he may not want to. I've sinned too much. I've made my bed and now I have to lay in it. Literally. 
I talked to somebody just the other day who's lost. And when I asked him about that, that's exactly what he told me. He said, I've done too much to be forgiven. But the friends persist and finally he agrees and they come to the house and there's no way in. So the man becomes even more convinced that his sin is blocking his access to the Savior. No matter how badly he wants to be healed and no matter how badly he believes that Jesus can do it. And the friends look around and the only possible access is to climb up the stairs on the side of the house and lower him into the covered porch that was in the center of of the dwelling. So they lug the man to the top of the house, they loosen the cover, and they lower the man to Christ. As the man lays there in front of the sinless Christ, he becomes even more aware and, and sensitive to the fact of his own sinfulness and the reason that he's paralyzed, how he's sorry for his sin, how he wishes that he could start over, how his heart breaks because of his condition. But surely there's no hope for him but then Christ speaks. And he says, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Still unable to move anything but his head, the man looks at Christ and he wonders, can this be true? Can, I mean, he's coming for physical healing. He's not coming for the sin to be forgiven. And he's laying there and he's looking at this man and he says, can he really forgive my sin but not only can he will he how many people do you know maybe you were there maybe you've been there but how many times have you have you known people who have gone who you try to convince them that they need to go to Christ for for salvation and they'll say oh i know that jesus can forgive sin i just don't think he'll forgive me I, again, I've done too much. I've gone too far. It's too late. I can't be forgiven. For us, the parallel exists. We sin. Even as Christians, we sin. We're convicted. And again, let's just be honest. We dread coming yet again and asking for forgiveness, especially if it's something we've already done and gotten forgiveness for, right? We almost have that dread that this time, after so many times before, that God's finally going to give up on us. But can I tell you something? Christ knows our heart. Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 6 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And in 1 John 1, 9, we read those words, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Just like with this palsied man, thank God Christ knows our heart. If we come in repentance and we confess our sin, Christ will forgive. Psalm 32 and verse number 5, once again, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah, stop and think about that. Anytime we go to Christ in repentance for our sin, aren't you glad that He knows our heart and based on His nature and based on who He is and based on who we are as the children of God, when we come to Him and we confess that sin and we repent of that sin, not only does He hear us, but thank God He forgives us. Why? Because He knows our heart. But notice also that we need to remember that Christ will silence destructive critics. Start with me in verse number 6. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your heart? 
Whether it is, is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine own house. Now the first thing that we have to remember is that not all criticism is destructive. We live in a world that has, or a culture that has completely forgotten that. If you criticize anything that I say, anything that I do, anything that I believe, then it's a destructive criticism. You're attacking me. But there is such a thing as constructive criticism. Some criticism is actually for our benefit. But again, let's be honest, we know that both kinds, constructive and destructive, exist. So as Christians, we face five critics of our Christian walk. Okay? One is God himself. Through the scriptures and the Holy Spirit, God causes us to examine our lives. James chapter number 1, starting in verse 22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So God himself uses the word of God and the spirit of God to, critic, to criticize our walk, not in a destructive way, but in a constructive way to show us where we're falling short, to show us there's an area of our life that needs our attention, to show us that there's something that's preventing us from living exactly the way that God wants us to do. So God himself, through his word, shows us the problems in our life. I've always loved the, the description here of James about looking in a mirror. Basically what it says is, or looking in a glass and it's talking about a mirror, he says, basically, if you hear the word and don't do anything with it, it's like looking into a mirror, seeing your hair's messed up and walking off and saying, I don't care. There ain't a woman in here to do that. Hey, some of you men wouldn't either. Some of you ain't got no choice because you ain't got much fool with. <laughs> but think about it. God convicts your heart, says, here's a problem. You hear it, whether it's through the preaching of the word, through, through it's your, maybe it's your own Bible study, maybe it's through a radio program like what God used to start this whole line of thought for me. And you hear it, and you see, yep, there's a problem. I see the problem. Oh, well. That's what he's talking about. He said, but... He said, when you look into that mirror of God's word and you see the problem, the person who's blessed isn't the person who heard it. It's not the person who read it. Thank God it's the person who heard it and read it and did something about it. So the first critic is God himself. I've, asked people, I've, I've had people ask me this question. They say, well, how do I know if I'm under conviction for a sin or if it's Satan just buffeting me? And the answer is that God's conviction, when God convicts us, and you've heard me say this before, at least some of you have, but it's God, when it's God's conviction, it is a cry to repent and return to a right relationship with God. That's the Holy Spirit. If it's the devil, he'll just point out your sin and convince you or try to convince you that there's no use in you going to God about it this time. See the difference? How do you recognize the difference? If it's the Holy Spirit, he drives you to Christ. If it's the devil, he drives you away. All right? God's conviction will always be followed by a call to come to him for cleansing. 
Isaiah chapter number 1, verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. As wool. Satan simply points out your sin and then allows you to wallow in anguish over it. And he will cause you to fear being obedient to 1 John 1, 9 that we quoted just a few moments ago. So God's critique of our Christian life is not destructive. It's constructive. But then the second critic of our Christian life is our own conscience. Now, again, through the promptings of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, we're commanded to examine our lives and see if we're living according to God's principles. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 15, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, again, let's just get down rubber meets the road and be honest. We can oftentimes be our worst critic. We look at others and we say, well, why can't I? And then you fill in the blank with whatever problem that you have. Self-examination is appropriate when we seek to live according to what we learn and what we know is the truth. But it can be destructive when all we do is critique ourselves without any effort to correct what we see or we dwell on what others are and what others have and what I don't. Ultimately, that kind of thing is spiritual envy, and it's a sin on its own. So sometimes the critique is God himself. Another critic that we have is our own conscience. But then a third critic is the body of Christ. The Bible plainly states that we're to watch out for one another's souls, and help if we see a brother or sister in a precarious situation. Galatians chapter number 6 and verse number 1 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, in other words, you see there's a problem, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. We're to Now, when we do that, when we go to that person to help pull them out and show them the problem and all of those kind of things, we're to exhort one another and we're to build one another up. We're not to be destructive, as Ephesians 4.29 warns so strongly. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good and to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Can I tell you something? And I've seen this happen. Man, I was in a church service one time. I was in a revival. I was preaching a revival. And this happened. And there was a, sin, a lost man there. And this lady, God bless her heart, she had the best of intentions. She wanted that man to be saved because he was, he was an older gentleman. And she wanted him to be saved more than anything else. And right there in front of him and everything else, she requested prayer for him and began to catalog all the bad things he was doing. And that happened in a revival. I'm not kidding. I personally thought I was going to die while all that was going on. What we have to understand, especially when it comes to our relationship in the body of Christ, I should care enough about you that if I see you falling into a sin, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to say, hey, look, I see this. Maybe I'm misinterpreting it. I don't know. But this is what I'm seeing, and this is the concern that I have. Don't you think you need to bring this to God and get it behind you and ask for forgiveness? It is not to go to that person and tell them how awful they are, and how they ought to know better, and all of these kind of things. Now, I'm not saying there's not a time that you have to get straight and talk to somebody straight up. But the spirit that we go in is a spirit of edification. If we do that, it's constructive criticism, and it will lead them back to Christ. 
if we go and all we're doing is telling them how awful they are and we're trying to be the Holy Spirit in their life instead of letting the Holy Spirit be it, then what it is is destructive and it can cause them to run in the exact opposite direction. But there is that criticism or that critique that's found in the body of Christ. Fourth, the lost are another source of criticism for the saint. When a lost person, now you get this, when a lost person criticizes our personal walk with Christ, it should cause us to examine our life. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes they're just sniping at somebody because they don't like Christ. And they see you as an, as an easy target. But if in the end, we can say with the Apostle Paul, as he did in 2 Corinthians 1.12, for our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you. If I can go to God and I can say, God, this is what so-and-so has said about me. As David said, I want you to open my heart, open my mind, point out if there be any sinful thing in me. And if at the end of that, you can honestly say that God has given you peace, that everything is all right, then you can walk away from that. Number one, thanking God for his peace. And number two, thanking God for the person who would point something out to drive you back to God to make sure you didn't have a sin in your life that was hindering your testimony. But that's the fourth critique. And then the fifth critique, or the fifth critic, is Satan himself. It's not by accident that Scripture refers to Satan in Revelation as the accuser of the brethren. And it says he doesn't rest day or night. But when it's Satan, even here, God has silenced our critic. Why? Because if Satan points out a real sin in our lives and he's beating us up over it, then we can go to God and confess it and put it behind us. But if he's simply harassing us, like I was talking about a minute ago, we can turn to Romans chapter number 8, verses 31 through 39, and rest in the promise and grace of God. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that's risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things uh, present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So even when Satan comes beaten at the door and you know that it's there, you can either take it to God and confess it and get it behind you or you can fall in front of God in the very throne room and read that passage of Scripture and thank Him for His grace and His mercy. He's a critic. And He wants to be destructive, but you don't have to let it be that way. Notice in this passage that both Christ and the man, sick of the palsy in Mark chapter number 2, were being criticized by the scribes. The man was being criticized for his sin. And Christ was being criticized for what they perceived as presumption. And Christ ended that criticism by what he did. Forgiving him of, forgiving him of his sins and healing him and allowing him to rise up and walk. Jesus said, what's the big deal? Is it easier to say thy sins be forgiven 
or rise up and walk. To show you that I've got the power and the authority to say thy sins be forgiven. Hey, get up and walk. If I can do one, I can do the other. And if I can do both, then you've got to take into account who I am. He silenced the critics. And thank God, Christ ends the destructive criticism we face. Because as that passage in Romans 8 says, it's he that saves us. It's he that guides us. And it's he that wants us to be all that he wants us to be. But then thirdly, we see the last point, And that's that we need to remember that Christ wants you to move on. Now look at verses 11 and 12 again. I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Did you get that? Christ told this man, he said, you're forgiven. Get up and walk. Christ said, you're forgiven, so rise and walk in the new life that's been given to you as a former paralytic. We see, that many, we see this pattern many other times in Scripture. The man at the pool of Bethesda in John 5, 14. Afterward, Jesus finding him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Move on. The woman caught in adultery in John 8 that we was talking about a minute ago. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Do you see the thing? Once the sin is forgiven, don't dwell on it. Don't rehash it. Don't second guess everything. You've been forgiven. Get up and move on. Christ's command when he forgives us of a sin is get up and move on for my glory. And that's one of the primary keys for us if we're going to have an abundant Christian life if your sin has been forgiven move on and do great things for God one of the biggest or one of the most common problems I'll say biggest but one of the most common problems that I see in people is that they'll commit some kind of sin. They'll do something that they shouldn't have done. God convicts them of that sin, and after a period of time, whether it's immediately or through a lot of circumstances or whatever else, they finally come to the place where they fall down at the feet of Jesus, and they confess that sin. They repent of it, and they confess of that sin, and Christ forgives them. But then they're handicapped by it. Satan beats them to death. I can't believe that you would think it's okay to do this and for Christ after what you did over here. I can't believe that you would think that it would be acceptable for you to stand up and sing in the choir or teach a class or whatever it is. You know what you did. How hypocritical could you possibly be? You ever been there? But that's not what Christ does. Christ forgives the sin, and then he says, get up and move on. You're not paralyzed anymore, so don't lay there and act like it. Ain't that, ain't that amazing? Isn't that the blessing of forgiveness? The fact that he knows our heart and our sincere efforts to live the Christian life, even with our failures, that he silences all the destructive criticism by the working of his grace and the truth of his word, and that he tells us to move on. 
Not just, well, I'm going to put you up on a shelf over here and you aren't ever going to be used again. How dare you? Now, don't get me wrong. There's some things you may do that you may not be able to go back into the same position you had. But that sure don't mean that God's going to keep you from doing anything at all. So he tells us to move on. And he, entails us to, and he tells us to enjoy the abundant life that he has for us. So the questions tonight are these. Are you living in the reality of the blessedness of forgiveness? Or is there some doubt that you're hanging on to that prevents you from getting up and moving forward? Is there a sin that you need to repent of and confess so that you can move forward? He's got the answer regardless of the question. If you're not living in the blessedness of forgiveness, is it because of unconfessed sin? Or is it because you're just tied up in knots over something that you did last week, last year, last decade? I've known people who have been paralyzed in the work of God because of something that happened 30 and 40 years earlier. They, they say, no, God forgave me of it. But Satan kept them so bound they could not, or they would not, not could not, they would not move on. So are you living in the blessedness of forgiveness? Or are you still being paralyzed even though Jesus has already healed you from it? Father, I've shared what you'd have me to share this night. And how I thank you for the assurance that we see in the blessing of forgiveness that's wrapped up in these 12 verses. Father, I pray that each and every one of us would examine our hearts. You tell us we should be one of those critics. May we examine our hearts and ask ourselves the question, is there unconfessed sin that is making me, that is keeping me paralyzed in the work of God? And if there is, may we have the courage and the conviction and the assurance that if we'll confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then, Father, once that's done, Help us to get up and start moving forward for your glory. We thank you and we love you that we don't have to wallow in the past. We don't have to be paralyzed by our failures. But once we're forgiven, we can get up and move on in your service who you call us home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. All hearts and minds clear. All hearts and minds clear. Aren't you glad for the blessing of forgiveness? Thank the Lord for his unspeakable grace and mercy. All hearts and minds clear. Then don't forget, this Wednesday night we'll be continuing on with our Standing on Solid Ground series, continuing to look at the Word of Faith movement, the problems that are there. I'm going to kind of summarize a few things that we saw in the video over the last couple of weeks and then get into what does the Bible say about these teachings, some of these teachings, uh, and uh, arm us for that. And then we'll move to the next phase, which is the stuff at Bethel and Hillsong and Elevation and, 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 you know, and try to answer the question why you know, uh, why, and, and I don't care, you know, it's just what it is, why when I talk to the music, the song leaders in our church, that I said, if it's these, we don't sing it. And this is why. And we'll explain to you why. Because, you know, there, there's a really good, I mean, I don't want to be perceived, and I'm not going to be perceived, or don't want to be perceived, as the Holy Spirit of God in your life. But as the pastor of this church, I am charged with protecting the sheep. 
And as part of that, sometimes you've got to make decisions for the church. And we'll show you kind of how that plays into this when we talk about Bethel Hill Song Elevation. Uh, and then after that, we'll talk about uh, those who say that they've toured heaven uh, or toured hell and talk about why those things are wrong. Uh, so we've got quite a bit to go through over the next few weeks. You just pray that God have his way, all right? All hearts and minds clear. And don't forget, those of you who are watching via live stream uh, that are on the uh, church Facebook page, uh, we'll be coming back the, uh, on the private side of the live stream here in just a few moments for prayer time, prayer requests, and praises. So you hang around. Those of you that uh, maybe are joining that are not part of that, thank you so much for being with us. Hope that the message was a blessing to you. Brother Jim, if you would, you dismiss us in a word of prayer. Amen. We'll be back here in just a few moments.